for our example project. Um, another way to put it is that we're going to take the wireframes that we created during the project design and bring them to life as a prototype. Um, if you remember, it's possible for you to have a couple wireframes for your project. That's not essential. You may only have one wireframe. The wireframe is sort of a very high level layout of where pieces of your uh, uh, elements of your web pages is going to be. Um, you might have different layouts if you have different sorts of pages, different kinds of pages. A good example that I give is that um, a, a gallery page might have a different layout than a page that has a lot of text on it. You know, that would be one example. Or you may have pages in a certain section of the site that for whatever reason that section is a little bit different and maybe has a sub-navigation associated with it. Or, as commonly is the case, maybe your home page looks a little different in layout than the rest of your pages. Um, on the other hand, you might just have one layout. You might just have one wireframe. And a wireframe, again, is just sort of a high-level sketch. And we're going to take and develop a prototype. Uh, and then we're going to take the prototype and finish it up to uh, a finished product. Remember, a prototype is meant to be a model. It is meant to be something that you can show to other people so that other people can look at it and say, yes, you're on the right track, no, you're not. Uh, the design document that we create is important. It provides important information. Um, for many people, though, especially the clients that you may be developing the website for, uh, what really brings the site to life is to actually see a real live web page. Um, and there's a lot of things that you need to test. You need to test it across browsers. You need to test it across mobile platforms and so on. And you can only do that when you have a, a prototype um, actual code. Um, so it doesn't need to be finished. It doesn't need to be complete. But it should be finished enough to give anyone viewing it an idea. Uh, of what the finished site is going to look like and how it's going to act. Now, one of the most important aspects of uh, a website, of course, is the navigation of it. Uh, one of the common complaints you hear people have about websites is that they can't find what they're looking for on them. Um, it, it doesn't do any good if, if a website's full of content if no one can ever find it, right? So you do pay special attention to the navigation. Um, what we're going to do over the next few classes is we're going to take the basic layout that we started on last week, on Wednesday, and we're going to create different versions of it, versions that are laid out different ways. Um, finishing up in creating a version that looks different in a mobile environment than it does in a desktop environment. But for now, we're just going to focus on the desktop environment, although we may have a few things to say about the mobile, uh, mobile environment. So let me download where we left off last time. And we'll continue doing it. We'll continue with enough CSS so that it looks semi-finished. Again, we're not necessarily going to shoot for perfect because the idea here is that this would be a prototype. The prototype, again, then, after people look at it and say, yes, you're on the right track, this looks good, then you go and you, you dot the I's and cross the T's and turn it into a, complete, a completed uh, website. It's definitely not too early to start thinking about your project and to start even working on your project and the prototype. We're certainly going to learn more CSS over the next week or so um, that you might find beneficial. But remember that a whole lot of preparation goes into the project design before you even get to making the prototype. So you can definitely start thinking of those things in advance. So, let's see. This is where we left off last time.
And I'm going to rename this folder to prototype one. Simply because what I'm going to do as I wrap up one version of the prototype, um, I'm going to copy this and we're going to make another version of the prototype. Now, one thing that I mentioned is that it's important for us to have the common HTML code as complete as we possibly can before we start taking our template and cloning it. Remember the process. We make a template. Uh, we make a, X, uh, a CSS file, rather, that goes along with the template. And then we go and we clone the HTML page. And we make a copy of that page for every page that's on our website. Now remember, the CSS is all in one file, but the HTML code is spread across several files. So therefore, you want to pay special attention and make sure that as much as possible, you have the common HTML code complete. So if we look at this page here, all right, the common HTML code is what's in the header, the navigation, and what's in the footer. We're going to do our best to make that as complete as possible because what we're going to do then is we're going to clone this for our home section, our home page, our music page, our schedule page, and our contact page. All right. So if we clone it and we decide we want to change something in the header, we want to include the band's logo or put something else in the footer and so on, then we've increased our workload because we have to go back and change it in four different places. Whereas if we change it um, in the template before we start cloning it, then if we decide we want to add something or get rid of something, we only have to change it in the one place. Um, I am less concerned about the CSS file because remember the CSS stuff is always going to stay in one file for the most part. So the fact that our uh, that that um, maybe I want to change the font and not use this font is something that I can go and decide later on. All right, and I can make the change in a single CSS file, and the entire site will be. Um, will be affected by it. Notice that this site is somewhat responsive. There's, there's a word in web design called responsive web design. And We'll go into more details about that later, but the gist of responsive web design is that the page responds to the size of the container that the content is in. So in other words, it doesn't stay fixed as you go and resize the window. That's important, and that's going to, in many cases, be a goal. You know, some sites aren't responsive. I don't think LC's site is responsive. So if we resize this window, notice how those columns stay the exact same size. Things don't get smaller. We're just cutting it off. So if we were going to view this on a mobile device, you know, it might look like this. And we'd have to scroll to the side to get the information over here. Whereas if we were going to view this in a mobile device, let's say it's that wide, then we really don't have to scroll. The, the, the content has adapted itself to the size of the screen. Um, sometimes responsive web design is called adaptive web design. And there might be a slight difference between adaptive and responsive, but I don't know the difference. So I, I use those two terms interchangeably. You can even, through Google Chrome and through other tools, Click on develop, Developers Tools, and you can do things like, oh, what are some of them? All 
uh, toggle device toolbar. So I can go and I can say, this is how my page is going to be on, on this size of a mobile device. On a Galaxy 5, this is how it's going to look. On a iPad, this is how it's going to look. On a iPhone, this is how it's going to look. And it's a good way to, that's, that's a good way to test um, how your page is going to look without having to have like a million phones and a million tablets. All right. Uh, there's also something called the Opera emulator, which is uh, op Opera mobile emulator, which you can use. It sort of serves a similar purpose. But um, since many people use Google Chrome, um, it's a good idea you know, to, to use the tools built uh, inside of that. Now, if you can notice, there's a few things like, for example, if you can imagine this, this doesn't look too hard to read, but this stuff kind of looks hard to read. We'll learn some things that you can do later on to make that look bi uh, bigger. But the idea is, is we're going to start paying attention to this stuff right away. We're going to start paying attention to how things look in multiple browsers right away. We're not going to do everything on the site and then go and test it on multiple platforms. Because you're just setting yourself up for a wor world of hurt there. All right? Because if you complete a project uh, before you do any cross-browser or cross-platform testing, you're liable to find all sorts of problems, all right? Whereas if you do a little bit of work, test it across platforms, do a little bit more work, test that across platforms, if there happens to be a problem, then you're, the, you're, the, the problem is isolated to a small section of code and it's going to be much easier for you to detect. So, I would open up this page not just in my favorite browser, like Google Chrome, but I would open it up in Firefox. I would open it up in Internet Explorer. I would open it up in Microsoft Edge. And I would open it up on a Mac. All right. Um, larger organizations have uh, test labs where they have computers set up with different browsers and, and more than that, different versions of browsers. All right. So, because keep in mind that all Internet Explorers don't behave the same. All right. Um, and, and therefore, what works in one version of Internet Explorer might not work in another. Um, and there are certain key versions where stuff got fixed that are important to test. Uh, my philosophy on, on cross-browser platform uh, compatibility is it doesn't need to look identical across platforms, but it needs to work across all platforms. So if for whatever reason, a border is off or something in a platform, eh, you might be able to live with, with a small discrepancy between one browser and another. But if it doesn't work at all, then, then you got a problem. All right, so I'm not entirely happy with this. I would like to work on the design of it a little bit more. All right, remember we spent some time talking about the uh, box module, or the, the box model, rather, uh, where we said every section on the page, every block tag you can think of is a big box. And that box has several properties. It has a margin, and this margin is in all four directions. So it's in horizontal and vertical. We have a border. We have padding. All right. And then we have width. Remember that the width of something gets added onto it, the padding and the margin and the border. So if I make something 400 pixels and I have a border and a margin and a padding, it's going to be wider than 400 pixels. It's going to add up all those going across. So I'm going to finish this. I'm going to make all these things sort of line up this way so that it's centered. Then I'm going to play around a little bit with the appearance. And again, keeping in the spirit of this being a prototype, 
I'm not going to be concerned about this looking perfect, but um, I want to illustrate, I want to get at least to a certain stage um, in this. Um, I'm going to go in and put code in for the section and the footer to center those in the same way. Ah, nothing works. We'll actually, we'll actually not talk about that for a while. We'll, we'll come back to that. Oops. I broke something in the CSS. At least in a couple of platforms. So it's the first case of there being a cross-browser compatibility issue. All right, notice that this is the way that it looks in Firefox. This is how it works, looks in Internet Explorer. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that in, in a couple minutes. All right? So, it's good that we tested across browsers right away because we can fix this problem right away. I actually think that this is how it looked in Internet Explorer before, and I just didn't. Uh, maybe I checked Edge and not Internet Explorer. I don't know. Yeah, still a problem in Edge, too. Interesting. But Firefox looks good, and Google Chrome looks good. All right. We'll come back to those other two in a bit. Um, we might want to change the fonts. Now, have we spoke much about fonts in this class? What are the two main Actually, there's sort of three main groups of, of fonts. Um, any idea what those three groups of fonts are? All right, how about this? Let's say there's two groups of fonts. Then we'll add the third one on. What are the two groups, two main groups of fonts that you have? Yeah, serif and sans serif. Sans is French for without. So sans serif means without a serif. If you guys didn't get it, I was going to say, does anyone remember the old Bob Marley, Eric Clapton song, I shot the blank? All right. What is a serif? A serif is a little thing on the end of a letter. That's, it's not very scientific, but it's probably the best way I can put it. So a serif, like if I look at the letter M in Mike Zeller's, if I'm going to draw it, it looks like this. And if I look at the I, the I looks like this. These things are serifs. So at a glance, I can see that my font here is a serif font. All right. Sans serif fonts are without serifs. So a sans serif M would look something like this. A sans serif I will look like this, and so on. We can go into Word if we want, and we can play around with those fonts. Go 
can play around with those and other fonts. Let's see where's where's Word at. This is Calibri. Is that serif or sans serif font? Sans serif. Um, this is century, serif or sans serif? Serif. What's the third kind of font? Pardon me? Exactly. It is, a uh, third kind of font is there we go. Well, you might classify that as a serif font, but definitely something like this. Well, that's not even. I'm trying to find a real good one. All right, here we go. Yeah, exactly. That sometimes is called like a decorative font, all right, where it's really neither uh, serif or sans serif. It sort of is a, an attempt to make it look like a handwritten font, all right. Um, I'm not a huge fan of those unless you have like a real specific uh, intent in mind. All right, so those generally to me look amateurish and um, not to say that they can't be done effectively, but they should be used sparingly. All right, so let's focus on the serif and sans serif fonts. When do you think it's better to use a serif versus sans serif? Can you think of any descriptive words for a serif font versus a sans serif font? Yes. Serifs look more formal. I'll buy that. What might be another word that you would describe a serif font as? Professional, maybe. Yes. Important, maybe. Classic, maybe. All right. What would you describe sans serif fonts as? Simple. All right. What was that? I, I'm, I'm still not hearing. Formal? They could be formal. Both sans, I think both sans serif and serif can be formal under the right circumstances. Simple, clean. Which one would you say is more modern looking? Sans serif. All right. If we were to look at Apple, for example. We will see that they use a specific sans serif font. And really, um, The, the font, again, we, we talked about Apple as doing a good job of, of branding their products, of making everything about their product have a consistent look and, and give a consistent message of being of simplicity, of cleanness, of, of being modern, and so on. And so again, notice they use sans serif font. Um, if we look at maybe a more traditional sort of organization, like the Wall Street Journal. They are done um, in largely serif fonts.
Is it okay to mix serif and sans serif bonds? All right. Actually, they have some sans serif here. So they're an example. I actually thought they did more mixing. That's why I picked them as an example. Here's a little bit of sans serif. This is sans serif. So you can mix serif and sans serif, but again, the choice to do it should be done purposefully. It should be done with a reason. All right. And what would be the reason for mixing them? Well, one of the reasons could be to make something stand out. All right? So these things are a little bit different, so they stand out. These things are a little bit different, so they stand out. What else do you notice this compared to the rest of the text on the page? Well, it's a lot smaller. All right. This text is probably smaller than this text. All right. So, to use a different font for emphasis is good to emphasize certain things. The other thing that's often done is is and you'll see many sites that do this is headlines will be in serif font the body of the article will be in sans serif font. That's often done. All right. um, simply because se uh, sans serif fonts um, at smaller sizes are sometimes a little more readable than, than serif fonts are. So you might mix them for emphasis, you might mix them for um, readability at smaller print. The idea is, is that you're going to do it for a reason. You're not just going to do it because we learned how to make different things have different fonts. All right? You're going to do it because you think that there's a good reason for doing it, to visually organize the page and so on. So let's go back to here, and, and I'm going to play around a little bit with the fonts. I want to make all my headings all my H1s, H2s, and H3s, and so on, I want to be in serif font. All my paragraphs and links and navigation and footer, I want to be in sans serif font. All right? Now, there are certain fonts that are called web safe fonts. Um, what are web safe fonts? Any idea? Yes. They're commonly used across websites, and you can be pretty sure that a browser understands them and knows what to do with them. Now, there are things that you can do to like download a font so that you can use uh, some oddball font that other people don't use. All right. And if you're doing a very stylized font, you can do something like that. So you can include font declarations in your code. But for now, we're going to stick with uh, web safe fonts. So I'm going to just Google web safe fonts and just pick some. And they have some examples of these. Another way to say web safe font would be more or less to say standard fonts. All right, to say standard fonts. All right. What's a mono what's a mono spaced font? Every character takes up the same width. All right. Um, I think that's a throwback to typewriters, 
right? Those of you talked to your great grandparents about using typewriters, all right? And when you would type um, mechanically the way it was set up, every letter would take up the same, same space. Fantasy or script is what I call decorative fonts. They just call it a little bit different. So I'm going to pick, I'm just randomly, I'm going to pick a couple. I'm going to pick a serif font and a non uh, a sans serif font. Now, one thing that you do when you choose fonts is that you typically give a couple of fonts. All right? Just on the odd chance that someone's browser doesn't understand the one font, it will try the other font. So I'm going to go and do this. And this, in fact, shows you the percentage of Windows versus Mac machines that, that have it. All right. So, for example, Georgia, 99% of all Windows machines has it, 97% of Macs have it. So, that's a pretty safe bet. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to go into my CSS file, and I'm going to say, H1, font family, Georgia. Now, I could, to be safe, pick another font. Like no, oh, let's see. Pick Lucinda Bright. Lucida Bright. I think I'm thinking of that one folk singer, Lucinda Williams or something. Lucida white or bright or whatever it says. I don't know. It's Monday. I can't read. Lucida bright. Now typically your string of fonts, typically yeah, you, you usually use like three fonts. You could use two or you could just use one or you could use more than that. But typically use three. And the way it works is like this. If your browser has the first font, that's the one it uses. If your browser doesn't have the first font, it will use the second font. If it doesn't have either of those two, it will use the default serif font for that browser. Every browser has to find a default serif and a default sans serif font. So I want my headings to be in a serif font, so I'm going to say H1, and I'm going to pick those. My preference is the first one, that it be, that it be Georgia. But if Georgia is not installed on a particular machine, then Lucida Bright, otherwise serif. So let's go and look, and we can save. And there, notice that the, the heading changed a little bit. Um, I can then say for paragraphs, I can specify my own font family, uh, a different set of font family. A very common one is Helvetica Ariel and Sans Serif. Helvetica is the only font, to my knowledge, that has had a movie made about it. And I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix, it used to be, but go and look up on Netflix Helvetica, and there's a documentary about the font Helvetica. It is the best movie about a font that I've ever seen. All right, so it is the only movie, but it's, it's still a good movie. It's, it's even entertaining, and they talk about, they, they spend a lot of time talking with like some world-class designers, and they talk about 
the pros and cons of picking one font versus another and, and so on. It's very educational. I, I occasionally show it in my multimedia class where, where we spend a little more time talking about fonts. This is a pretty standard one. All right. Um, Ariel, in fact, was Microsoft's copy of Helvetica. Rather than paying the people that made Helvetica some money for the rights to it, at least originally, they, um, they, they developed their own that's almost the same, but just a little bit different. Another one that I like is I like Futura. Same rules apply. You specify three, it will apply the first one that the browser has. Now, there's a few things I don't like about this. It seems like there's a lot of extra space on the top and bottom here, and I don't like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to see where that space comes from. And I'm guessing that I have padding on the top that I don't really want. So I could say padding 3 pixels, 10 pixels. Does anyone remember what that means when I specify two numbers for the padding? Yes. Exactly. The top and bottom use the first parameter and the left and right use the second. So it goes around on a clock. The top gets 3, the right gets 10, the bottom gets 3, the left gets 10. Let's tighten it up a little bit. Could also be the margin and I could do the same thing Thing with that, maybe lower the margin to ten pixels. All right. Actually, that that did the margin of the, not the things within it, but the margin inside of there. Um, All right, that's a little closer to what I want it to be, so we can stick with that. Again, keep in mind it's a prototype. The aim is not to make it look perfect. Yes? Uh, for the font, uh, do you use more Google font? Do you still use uh, sort of backup font? Specifically? Generally speaking, yeah, uh, just in case the browser doesn't support it. Okay. Yeah. Um, one, one, um, one of the hardest things or one of the, the biggest challenges with web development is you don't know how someone is going to be accessing your site, what sort of the device they're going to be having. They could be running an extremely old browser, all right? And at some point, maybe you, you say, well, we're not going to support before a certain browser. Um, ideally, I hate when I see people say this, this site is best run using this browser or that browser. I mean, you don't really see that as much as you used to. In the old days, you'd see this all the time. This is best run on Netscape or, or whatever. Um, my idea of the internet is that it should work um, across as many platforms as possible, but working doesn't mean that it needs to look identical. All right? so. Um, if you would use a different font in, in a lower end machine, in an older machine, using an older browser, that's okay as long as it's still workable. But yeah, I would specify alternatives. Now, last thing I'm going to do with this is I want to make the uh, links look more like buttons. Okay? So let's try to do that. Now, I'm going to go and I'm going to try to put a margin on the LI. Notice I said try, because I don't think this is going to work.
I'll try to put a 10 pixel margin on the LI. And I lied, it worked. Let's try to give them a background color. I'm going to make it slightly darker than the rest of the page, and the rest of the page has a body of Two hundred, two hundred, two hundred. So I'll say background RGB one fifty, one fifty, one fifty. All right. I'm going to try to give these a width. Ah, that didn't work. I knew something wasn't going to work for me today. Now, that looks like the right syntax, right, with colon ADPX, yet it didn't work. Here's why it didn't work. I specified these, display, these LIs to have a display of inline. What does that mean for a display of inline? A display of inline means that they're stacked side by side. Like this. A display of block indicates that they're displayed as a block. You can only assign certain attributes to block tags. Now, we have a problem here because I want to make these look more like a button. I want to make these look more like a button, yet I can't put a width on them because I've made these inline because I want them to be stacked horizontally. There's a little, it's almost like a cheat. It almost seems like you shouldn't be able to do this, but you can. Where you can say inline, inline block. What that does is it treats it like an inline tag, but it allows you to put some of the properties that you typically only can put on a block tag. So it's like, you know, Someone put peanut butter in my chocolate, someone put chocolate. It's like two mints in one, right? It's both a block and an inline tag. It's inline in that you can, they're stacked horizontally. It's block in that you can give it a width. All right, so now we've given it a width. Unfortunately, I've given it too wide of a width, so I'm going to go and I'm going to adjust the margin. I want them to be stacked side by side, but there's not enough space. So I'm going to go and change this to 60 pixels. All right. And now they fit like that. Now, if I want to make them look a little more like a button, I can put some padding on them. Thank you. All right, still a little too wide. I'll make this 50. All right, not bad, not bad. Schedule is cutting it out a little bit. 
Let's try 55 and All right, we have that. Um, we could put a border around it. We could center the text within it. Now, I'm, I know I'm going through these properties a little quick, but we'll revisit these. Text line centers will center the text inside it. And I can make the color of the text something other than blue and underlined. So, for example, I could say color. Actually, I, if I'm changing the color of the link, I have to make it on the link itself. So links in here, I can make the color white. Text decoration. None. And then I have things that look like that. By applying the hover property, I can actually change these things to give a little effect when I put my mouse over them. So I could do something like this. I could say nav li hover. And I could make the background a little bit darker when I put my mouse over it. Whoops, it should be a colon hover. That's called a pseudo class. And when I put my mouse over it, I sort of get a button effect. I could also do things like play with the border to actually make the button look like it's being depressed into the screen to give a sort of fake 3D effect for that. Um, I don't like the extra space on the top of the button, so I will do what? Margin 0px. That tightened it up a little bit. Maybe I'll make the padding 0px. Oops, I didn't want to do that. But I could play with that to get the, get the size that I wanted it to be. All right. I think we are set with our first version of our template. What we would do, and we'll pick up on this on Wednesday, is after we're set and we're reasonably happy with it, I can clone this page and make my home page, music page, schedule page, and contact page. What we'll do from there then is we'll play around with different layouts. And the good thing is, the good thing about this is that if we're sure that our CS, uh, I'm sorry, if we're sure that our HTML is correct, all we have to do is change that one CSS file. It's sort of like the CSS Zen Garden example I showed you before. The HTML stays constant, but by applying different CSS files, we can make these pages look way different. And we'll explore trying to make these pages look as different as possible um, next time. All right, questions? We'll see you up in lab.